Hi, everybody. It's Jody Puggett, president of the Americas at Personetics, and welcome to the Banking on Innovation podcast. Today, I'm very pleased to invite a very special guest, Hans Morris, to the podcast. Hans, welcome to the podcast. Nice to be here, Jody. Thank nice you. Nice to see you. Yes. You nice too. to hear you. <laughs> yeah. Hans has an amazing background and set of experiences. He's currently managing director of NICA Partners. He's also chairman of the board at Lending Club, and he sits on several other fintechs, including yours truly, Personetics, which we really appreciate, Hans. Hans, why don't we start with NICA? Introduce NICA and its business model to our audience. And what makes NICA unique in this sea of investment firms? Well, I think when we started it in 2014, I felt that there was, at least at that point, a big uh, gap in, um, in venture, in fintech venture, in that there were, let's say there were several hundred fintech startups, but, um, but even the very best venture firms and you know the top tier, and, and they're excellent firms, by the way, and continue to make smart investments, but they, they didn't have partners that had really significant expertise in the financial system. So lots of questions would come up about how do you fund? What regulatory process should you follow? What, what, uh, how are you going to get these licenses? Uh, what, uh, what's the sales? How do you sell into large complex financial services um, companies? What in fact is the problem? Can you define with precision the problem and how much risk you're going to take to solve that problem and how much capital will take? And so what I felt was that if we had a firm that was composed of real experts on the financial system, that would help. It'd help entrepreneurs solve, you know, if you could save an entrepreneur six months, that's that's a lot, actually. And if you can help them solve, uh, keep them from pursuing the wrong thing for a couple of years, that could be very uh, impactful. And the idea uh, also, and the, the name NICA uh, is, stands for New York, California. And by the way, it's very hard to come up with a name for a venture capital firm. <laughs> but we wanted to come up, that's the best we could do. But the idea was that we wanted it to represent New York representing the, the financial system, uh, the legacy financial system, and, and um, California representing where a lot of the innovation was taking place, particularly at that point that bridging those two uh, would be uh, valuable. And, um, and, and I think that uh, that is still true today. NICA, you know, eight years later, uh, a lot's changed and there's a lot more expertise. And now there's thousands and thousands of, of uh, fintech companies. And, um, but I do think we still have that reputation of helping uh, help entrepreneurs navigate that complexity and come to better decisions. And we could talk more and give more examples of that. But I think that that's what we do uh, particularly well. And what's also interesting is when we started NICA, we, the, the capital really all came from me and then, and then people that I knew who have backgrounds in financial services or technology. And our, our investment committee, we created a unique structure. I don't think anyone else has done this, maybe – Maybe people will say 10 years from now, it was a really stupid idea, or maybe we'll say, boy, that was really brilliant. But we started, we created an investment committee. With, it was really me putting up capital with five other people. And those five other people were uh, Max Levchin, who founded a firm and, and, uh, and co-founded PayPal, and Osama Badir, who, who was the head of the, had been the head of the Google wallet and then founded a company called Point, which was a POS system. Uh, um, Tom uh, Miglis, who was the uh, the head of, he had been the CIO at Citadel, the big hedge fund for, I think, 18 years. And he had been the CIO of Solomon Brothers, uh, which is where I met him. And uh, then uh, Brian Finn, who was the president of Credit Suisse, and Charlie Songhurst, who was the, the head of strategy at Microsoft. So those five people each put in money. I put in money. They were our investment committee. We met every two weeks. Uh, and we also then created a group of people that were other individual investors who were all experts too. And we started this monthly pipeline call with that whole group. And then when we did our first institutional fund uh, a couple of years later, we kept that structure and we, and we, we 
formulated, we, we, we uh, institutionalized these, this group of investors and we call them limited partner advisors or LPAs. And that group serves on boards, helps us on everything. And you know, Bobby Mehta is an example. He was one of the first LPAs. And our investment committee, we've changed uh, Max um, Levchin went, went off it because he was obviously quite busy with uh, a firm and Brian Finn went off last year. We've added uh, Frank Yeri uh, and Magdalena Yelsey. And it's it's really, I, I love it. I think it's such a good system. Uh, it's, it, part of the benefit is it's not political. You know, it's really, it, it makes it so that you have a very, I think a very effective decisioning process. And then also this LPA group, but now is almost 80 people. It's just, it's extraordinary. Somebody on, the, on that group is is one phone call away from the truth and, and can help break through problems that co- companies uh, encounter. So, so that's really unique. It's hard to make it work. Believe me, <laughs> we put a lot of effort into it, but we're uh, but we we I really think it's um, it's valuable and it's hard to do. So that's um, that's what what we think is different about us. Fascinating background. Well, I know our audience is going to learn a lot, but I have to say, first thing I've learned is that NICA was New York, California. I did not know that. <laughs> so yes. it's good to know. Well, I'll but- tell you the other the other name. <laughs> Uh, that we thought what, we had a whole bunch of names, uh, but one was the Vasari uh, corridor, which connected the the uh, the Medici's uh, financial <laughs> yeah. interests, right. uh, commercial interests with their art. Uh-huh. The Vasari corridor, yeah. famous uh, passageway uh, in Florence, and. My wife said, "If you call it Vasari Corridor, everyone's going to think you're a total asshole." And so, and so, so that <laughs> didn't choose that. Oh uh, well, I'll, I'll tell you on a more serious note and appreciative note. Um, Nike Partners has been an amazing uh, partner for Personetics and for me personally. And I want to underscore what you said, which is the limited partner team that you have is amazing. And I know I try and fully capitalize on it. And uh, mm-hmm. and prominently is uh, is Bobby Meto, who um, who you know I'm in, in who's a constant counselor to me and, and invaluable. So he's he's just an extraordinary. He's a good example because he's not only very expert. He's he's an extraordinary person. Uh, I mean, he just he's so I I I think he just has uh, great judgment. And and I could go up and down the list yeah, of, of, of others who are LPAs. And, yeah. and I feel the same way. And I yeah. think it's it's like. Obviously, it wasn't. It, there, there was intentionality in the types of people we saw it and people we knew. But it, as a group, it's also uh, just a, an excellent group. It, it, there's a, there's a, there's so many people, and they respect each other's expertise, and and there's such a range of expertise. So it's um, yes, it's something that we're very proud of, and I'm glad. Uh, and it, yes, and I also think um, you know the the. You do make good use of it, and I mean that in a very constructive way. You 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 um, you've come up with some very innovative ideas on how we can use the group to help uh, advance personetics, and I think also um, help some of like the banking partners understand their challenges and how to both uh, you know how to how to move faster, which is what everybody you know wants to do. Yeah. Let's talk more about your your background. Then I want to get into some of your perspectives on the industry, which I think will be terrific for the for the audience. So you have a very unique perspective. You were an operating exec at City for a long time, um, understand technology well. Then you were the the president at uh, at Visa, and you've you've um, you've had access to some of the most influential kind of you know FIs and fintechs as uh, as part of NICA. How have your previous roles? helped you be, to be more of a savvy investor and an advisor to both management teams, but also to the financial services operating teams? I think there's a lot of luck in everyone's career. And I, but, and I think that what, I, what happened to me was I was, a, I was an investment banker for my first 20 years. And I was at Smith Barney, you know, which was a, a small, like a medium-sized investment bank. But the first really lucky thing that happened is Sandy Weil, Bought Smith Barney. Jamie Dimon was the was the at that point. I think he was thirty. I think he had just turned thirty year old CFO. Uh, and then there was there was just a, a, a truly um, 
extraordinary group of inve- of executives that went to work at what became Travelers. We then bought Shearson, we bought Travelers Insurance, we bought Solomon Brothers, and then we merged with City. And for those 10 years, which was 88 to 98, when we merged with City, I thought it was, I just thought I had the best job. I thought it was the best company in the world. <laughs> I, I, I learned so much from so many executives and I quote them all the time. And the things that we've discuss, for example, financial design is something that that that's just the way I formulated my view of the world based on what those executives did. So it was it was stealing good ideas on, on how to operate. And there was a lot of emphasis on being a good operator. And we bought lots of companies. And and at the same time, I was advising I became head of the financial um, services group when I was uh, 29, and uh, which I tell everyone, just shows you how, how bad the choices were that they had, that they gave me that job when I was 29. But I, I had this, and, and this is, I think, um, it's something which has stayed with me for a long time, which I, and I use this, I say this to others, and I, I believed it in, in my own career. At that point, I said, you cannot be excellent in anything in financial services, if you're copying someone else's strategy, you have to, because the circumstances that made them excellent no longer exist. And so therefore, uh, what I felt when I became head of that group, I said, we're not going to, we're not, if two banks are going to merge, we're not going to get that assignment at Smith Barney right now. We don't have, we don't have 20 years of of doing, we don't have a big, a large group, and we're going to lose to to Solomon Brothers or Goldman Sachs or Lehman Brothers or or Morgan Stanley or someone. And or first boss, which had a, you know, top tier firm at that point. And so I said, we're going to focus on what were, we call the subsidiary activities, the underlying businesses that made up banking, because banks are really just conglomerates and, and they're composed of a payments business, a credit card business, a uh, uh, custody business, uh, a commercial lending business. And we became experts in those underlying businesses when no one else was doing that. And, and so that's what got us into credit cards very, very early. And we ended up building the, by far the, the, the largest credit card um, investment banking group. That's where I met Bobby actually, and and, uh, and a lot of other people. Uh, Dave Nissen is one of our LPAs, was running GE's uh, consumer business, and we did an advisory assignment for him. I, that's right, then through that, I met Nigel Morris at QED, who was at that point, co- just became yeah. co-head of the credit card business right. at, uh, at Signet Bank. You know, we ended up doing the IPO of, of Capital One. We did a lot of... Lots and lots of M and A work for for first data. It all came out of that focus. We 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 advised, I think, on every single debit network assignment. Maybe maybe not maybe seven of eight of them or something. But we did almost all of them because we really had this point of view that debit networks, which were really just shared ATM networks, it was a mechanism for regional banks to compete with Citibank. And the first one was nice. We're all the banks in New York sure. teamed up so they could have an ATM network that was equivalent to City, because in the in the 80s, City's market share, deposit market share shifted five percentage points because of ATMs in New York. That 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 was an incredible shift, organic shift. Um, and in, an example of how a technology competitive advantage became very significant. So the other banks formed a debit network so that they could um, route transactions amongst each other. And from that came uh, you know, pin-based debit. And we said, this is these are payment networks. They're not just cost savings things. These could be independent revenue generating businesses. So all that came out of that focus saying, well, we're going to do this because no one else is doing it. That's what we're going to focus on. We're going to become the experts in all these underlying businesses. So that's still, when, when uh, so that experience and, and uh, working with lots and lots of banks, insurance companies, and um, investment management firms, it gave me, um, first of all, exposure to to mit- really all aspects of the financial services um, industry. Second, it gave me, you know, connections and people, a network of you know senior executives across the industry. And you and I've seen a lot of things that don't work well, and I have a lot of good understanding of the um, the 
organizational behavior of these companies and how they make decisions and why it's hard to do certain things, how the regulators work. So all that context is very valuable to me. And then, you know, when we merged with Citi, I, I became the chief operating officer for the investment bank, where we're really trying to put together how does Citibank and Solomon's but Barney interact? How does that coverage model work? How does that how how are we going to be delivering those services? What are those services? And uh, I'm working through a lot of other operational problems. And then I became CFO. And then the following year, technology and operations started reporting to me. And, and that was, you know, a very complex global organization. We had, I think, 60,000 employees at that point. And um, this is just the institutional part of city. And we had, uh, we were in 100 countries. And it was about a $30 billion revenue base and a billion six balance sheet. So some disaster happening at all times, you know, some problem. And so I tell everyone I have a lot of experience with disasters in terms of <laughs> understanding how, why things go wrong, how hard it is to change them. And it, it's rare that something comes up that I, I haven't had some exposure to in some way. And, and Visa, similarly, you know, when I left, uh, it was definitely the luckiest thing that happened to me is, um, leaving Wall Street in June 2007, so just before the financial crisis, and I joined Visa. And, uh, and you know, Visa was just completing a restructuring, which was then going to result in an IPO the following year. But that was a lot of, you know, my task was um, pulling together all these disparate regions of which, you know, each, each region of, of Visa was really a separate company under a very loose confederation almost, and make it a company. And so a lot of things which I learned at City and, and Travelers were very relevant to that. And um, it's also an amazing network and of, of people and organizations that were connected to it. So all that really, I mean, gave a very good basis saying, OK, I understand what the problems are well. And then I got started getting more exposure to new technologies, which we really uh, didn't have that much exposure to at, at City or at Visa, honestly. And I joined General Atlantic for four years, which was, you know, uh, also very important to me because that's a, you know, just a, a, a one of the best um, investment firms. I learned a lot from them, and and they're all growth equity, so later stage, but uh, but just great people to learn from about the investment yeah. process. Terrific. So Hans, this is a very exciting, let's call it transition for the industry. There's economic uncertainty emerging competitive threats, and then, of course, customer behavior changes as well. What do you see as the most important technology challenges and decisions that are facing banks and credit unions now? Well, I think that the most important issue is to take friction and, and friction based on technology out of the consumer or, or, or business customer experience. And it's everywhere. And that includes, you know, bad, bad practices, fee, fee arrangements that don't make a lot of sense, uh, lots of forms, lots of redundant uh, activity, and a core attribute of all these things is that data is not well organized to deliver highly personalized, relevant and, and, and fair um, proposals. And the standards, uh, you've heard me say this, the table stakes should be, uh, is, is every single interaction with that customer, is, is the service, is it, is it seamless? Is it fair? Um, is, it, is it safe? And is it relevant to them? And, and that, that sounds pretty straightforward, but it's, if you say how many, uh, how many, companies in all aspects of financial services, this is banking, uh, insurance, uh, asset management, how, what percentage of the time does that transaction, does that interaction live up to that standard? And I'd say not very often. It's, it's rare when, it, when, it, uh, when it, it gets delivered. So that, that's the challenge. Now, in order to do that, to, to, you need a lot. You need to say, okay, what can we deliver that in any form of interaction that that customer wants or, or, or should want. And 
that's complicated because typically all the delivery inside a bank or insurance company is the, 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 the different delivery me mechanisms operate somewhat independently from each other or they're, they're not integrated in a modern tech stack. That would be a better way of putting it. And that also includes making sure that the data is organized in a way that it's easily accessible by that institution to deliver according to that standard. And that they also have the um, AI machine learning tools and, and executive and team able to interpret that data to make sure that, the, in, that everything that's being delivered fits that standard. So that's quite a challenge. And, um, and maybe we could break that down and follow up on that, but that's what I see as the objective that each institution has. Yeah, it's it's fascinating. You know, it's it's the simplicity of what you said, which is the real challenge. And in fact, one of the things that that we talk about also is that, and this is a, a microcosm of what you just laid out, which is that we believe that a basic version of personalized insights and advice will be table stakes and ubiquitous, offered by all banks, five thousand plus banks over the next two years. It will be table stakes, and it'll be what customers expect. But to do that is, is quite challenging because yeah. even to do a basic version of that, you need to understand the customer context. Who is this customer? Affluent customer or living at the margin? Their current situation in terms of what does their transaction activity say about their current needs? Then what is the right kind of advice I should give them? Either be aware of something or take action. And then lastly, provide evidence as to why I'm giving advice as well. Like why is this the best option or action for you to take right now. So it's that it's that it's very it's it's simple to explain but actually quite challenging to do. But some of the techniques and 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 technologies are actually there for the industry to to capitalize on this capability. I agree and that's the part of the reason we were so uh interested in personetics when we made the first investment um 6 years ago, 7 years ago, something like that. It was it was that this this was going to be table stakes and um and that you Personetics offered a software layer that allowed those um that interpretation of what needs to get done to be then made with high degree of satisfaction to the customer and flexibility to adjust that to whatever each individual institution wanted to achieve as well as all the you know, unique characteristics of the customer in that institution. And so that's a hard thing to do. Uh, but that, uh, but I, I do think keeping those four criteria uh, um, in the top of mind at every single institution is what is important. And I think when I, when I often will talk to um, senior executives of, of a bank or insurance company, I will say to me, if you, if you say, keep those four criteria in mind, okay, let's, you got to get started here. And one thing I, I find is that many institutions, they spend too much time focusing on the wrong thing, too many resources. Um, it's, and I, I think you need to pull this together at the most senior level of the, of the bank to then say, let's set some very clear and pretty ambitious goals in a short period of time to to start delivering on this and and you know an example i would use i often use is let's eliminate forms no one should be filling out forms particularly customers <laughs> got an existing customer why are you filling out a form and that requires reworking it it's not like you can say well let's let the new product people go figure that out that that like the general counsel has to be part of that and saying yes i can eliminate i can figure out a way so that I can eliminate a lot of these requirements in forms just by or the redundancies or the fact that they're not consistent across the, all the organization. And let, let's solve that problem so that it's the whole management team is solving, is meeting some objectives rather than trying to delegate it to uh, some team related technology. Because in, in a lot of ways, it's not necessarily a technology problem, which is causing the friction. Yeah. Hans, you spend a lot of time with FIs in the context of capitalizing on the fintech investments and capabilities. What have you seen that distinguishes those FIs that can move with pace in terms of innovating rapidly and doing it at scale 
versus those that appear more slow footed? I think that they I think it it starts with the CEO and that whole management team that they they have that um they've they've got the management team like, clearly aligned on what they're trying to do and trying to meet some of those objectives. So similar to the example I just went through. Um I don't think I actually don't see this being a technology problem. It's a, it's a leadership issue and it's, it's getting, you know, making sure you have good technologists, uh, but in many cases, good technologists want to work in a company where they, where they've got, where they're a central part of the management team and they, they feel that their views, they're getting the resources and, and, and the, recognition to go execute on things. Uh, and I'll, I'll, p- I'll pick one example just because it, it struck me how different this is. Um, so when I when I was at City, uh, and this is, you know, I left 2007, but in that, I think, say, four, five years, I was on the operating committee, and I don't think we ever really had a presentation about technology. We, 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 we might talk about, okay, a data center, you know, here's where we are in this data center strategy or something, but it was more, it wasn't like, this is what we need to, here's how it, here's how this is organized. This is what we need to do. Here's some key objectives. And we had built, we had developed a, a plan and I, I wanted to present it and we just never got, you know, too many other things that we need to talk about. Well, to me, that uh, that's very different, particularly for the, the companies that I think are, doing a good job, like there's a lot, a clear understanding of what we're doing, what are the key deliverables, where we are on it, what sort of results we're seeing. And the CEO will can talk about it because they're fluent in it. They don't have to say, well, let me have this person. They, they're acknowledging what that tech team is doing and they're totally on top of it. And they're saying, this is one big initiative that we're gonna get done and we're executing well. And so that to me is it's that alignment and clarity and that the whole team is working on it together to deliver it, not that you've got, you know, a, an innovation group, which is responsible for this. Yeah. And, um, and those trade-offs, like where, you know, do you want to spend more money on this? Um, I think and understanding that, it, and, and it's not, it, it's one thing, um, I would often say is it's not just spending more money, but it's it's also like just pacing, understanding where how much you know more money want to say solve some of these problems, but having it be front and center of the management focus of the entire enterprise is what's to me most important. And then part of that, another key thing is creating a productive technology ecosystem so that the uh, that you are efficient to interact with with new with with fintech companies because you know no one no one could build all the stuff themselves you're going to have to rely on outside vendors but do you make decisions quickly um, you've heard me talk about the three three meetings to POC rule which I, I feel like if a if a company of a bank can't make a decision on what to test something in three meetings then that's not a very efficient a company and um, and similarly, you should not be wasting your time having endless meetings after endless meetings after endless meetings. If you can't get to a POC to test this out in like three meetings, maybe four, but something like that, that it helps create a good standard for both the the enterprise company and the the fintech company in terms of um, where both of them should be focusing. Let, let, let's dive a little deeper into that. What what advice would you give to banking executives? who many of them appreciate and desire to create a powerful ecosystem of value, leveraging fintech providers to be able to deliver that. What advice would you deliver there? I, it's very similar to what we just said, which is a uh, number one, I'd have very strong clarity and own, which is owned by the entire management team on what are the priorities so that everyone can talk about it. And therefore things that fit into those priorities, get quickly approved and, and and tested and implemented. They're part of that priority set and don't waste a lot of time and money on things that aren't in that. Have a uh, 
create a standard so that you can quickly test and try new new types of technology that fits those areas of focus. So three meetings to POC, I think is a great rule. Tell your management team, I don't want to hear about that someone's had had 12 meetings, we can't make a decision. Pay for the POCs. Um, I feel that uh, if you're if you're an organization, you're not willing to pay $10,000 or $20,000 to do a POC, well, then it's not a very high priority. So, <laughs> But it makes a difference, I think, to the uh, to the, and it's a good just a good way of saying we're putting yes, we'll pay you twenty thousand dollars for this this test. And um, uh, I also would then celebrate if you get the reputation of being good to work with, then best companies will want to work with you. We definitely, I definitely will talk to our. I've talked spoken to you about this, where I'll say, this company that they. they make good decisions they implement if it works they will implement it they are fair and straightforward to deal with you won't run around circles a million times where someone else will take forever to make a decision priorities change all the time uh it's you know they've it put you through all kinds of vendor ropes i feel if i was another another thing i would do which is a, t- a technical issue but it creates a lot of friction it's not necessary and it goes back to the point I made earlier about getting the whole management team to agree on making processes work better. But, you know, the, the vendor onboarding um, for banks is it's a mess. It's complicated. And it's, it's complicated for a good reason, because, in, you know, there are a lot of vendor problems, uh, both security issues, uh, bad customer experiences that, that the banks would blame on a vendor for you know, robo dialing or uh, robo signing or you know, all kinds of problems, and uh, and so the vendor regs, which came into um, into effect across the um, with across all the regulators in 2013, that was a necessary requirement. But you don't need to have someone fill out a 500 question questionnaire to do a POC, and you could you, sh- you can make it say, look. What are the issues? Well, what data is going to be used? Is how do we secure that? Right. What, if you know, let's right. use dummy data so we don't have to use real data for this test. Or just get that whole process greatly simplified so that you can do a test really quickly and get the results and do more tests and and see what's going to work. Yeah. And um, so that that's an, those are all examples of things that I think it, when you have that reputation, people say this is a very good process it's tight it's well run people know what we're looking for we get answers quickly have a period of interaction where a couple times a year you can meet with representatives find forums where you can your team can do something with the tech community those are all good uh, practices i think which will help create that reputation very good the other thing we talked about a little bit earlier was around just this uh some of the analytics capability that are that are evolving yeah, I'd like to get your perspective more on that as well. So what do you think about the advancements in machine learning and data analytics and how it's how it's changing the way banks will compete and also deliver value for their customer franchise? Yeah, well, it's 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 I mean, it's it's the essential skill. And and it's and it's already important, but it's going to be more and more important. And it's. Uh, you know, it's a complicated problem to solve, which is how do, what is the data model that you're going to have? Or how do you create a data model similar to, you know, that uh, uh, um, any of the, like, uh, not just Google, but, you know, any, any of the companies that you admire would have, right? They all have a similar definition uh, and, and precision around definitions and, access and rules and access, which enable it to be much more accessible and analyzed in a consistent way across the organization. So that design and data model is probably one of the more complex issues. That is a complicated topic. And I would say the CEO and the management team need to have a plan together that, which is a multi-year plan in all, all likelihood. And some of the things we could come back to this about, you know, core, changing your core or not. But I think that that is a core core. It's an essential part of that whole data model design 
what what is the nature of the core processor that you'll be using and how will data fit into that. But then I think the other key uh, ingredient is building the the team, uh, a data scientist team that has high visibility inside the enterprise and creating enough of a um, enough experts so that there's consistency of a common vocabulary, common way of looking at things. You're using a, a similar stack for analytics and that you can disperse those people throughout the different business units so that everyone is, you have the skill set to do data analytics at a um, sophisticated level throughout the, the company. And I think every, every company of every size will have to have that. And, you know, it doesn't mean that you have to have, you know, a bunch of PhDs, but you have to have people that definitely know how to use the the essential tools. You have to decide what tools you're going to be using. They obviously everything has to be compliant, which is another feature of this. But I I think um, it, it is clear to us, at least, that AL machine learning in a compliant way will be an essential part of every single, um, you know, financial services company of the future. You know, you talked about some of the challenges in terms of creating the simplicity, but it's also, I believe, one of the most exciting periods in financial services. The opportunity to take a real leap forward, to outcompete some of these, you know, other players, these new distribution points, um, to leverage the fintech community, to take advantage of open banking. It's, it's just a very, for those FIs that embrace this challenge and see this as an opportunity to, to actually create a, uh, a, a leap ahead and even separate themselves from, let's say, kind of laggards or also rands. It's, it, it can be perceived as a, as a very exciting and, uh, and rewarding opportunity for banks. Yeah. And actually, you know, we could go, let's go back to something you said, because I think this is a, um, that's a great way of linking in another point about what what should a bank do and what's a gap and i'd say one thing fintechs have done well is they've taken segments customer segments that banks would either perceive as not profitable or not attractive or business segments uh and i'll get to the business segments in a second but on the on the um on consumers you know I think Chime or or one of our portfolio companies, uh, Propel, you know, Propel has um, 6 million customers who are on uh, food stamps and they use it all the time and they profitably make it easier for those customers to navigate, you know, government benefits. And they've created a debit card, which I think is is a fair and good product for that uh, community. And... But no one ever would have thought that that would have been possible looking at it from a bank standpoint. And, and, um, and Chime, too. Chime, a lot of Chime's customers, they profitably service customers that most banks wouldn't think are profitable. And so that is, to me, a good opportunity to rethink how you deliver to certain segments to say, OK, how can we make this profitable using a different type of technology and delivery system? And with small businesses or or larger businesses, every bank will have segments that they are focused on, whether it's real estate lending or uh, or or law firms or uh, or uh, healthcare providers or uh, the trucking industry or logistics industry or uh, any any vertical, uh, you know, um, real estate management companies and. And the, the issue is all those industries are going through tech transform digital transformation as well. And what is definitely clear is that there are excellent w- opportunities to create, in a sense, a finance a financial operating system around that industry. So instead of delivering services as products, it is that you become the operating system for Okay, let's let's. How do we optimize settlement? Um, you know, every single real time transactions are are already on their way to being ubiquitous. Next year's FedNow goes live. Um, seventy, I think it's over seventy countries now have live real time systems. 
So that transforms working capital. Every single company will have a different equation in terms of the, the, the what is the optimal cost of a transaction, the speed of that transaction, uh, the risk associated with that transaction, and how can you help for some vert- industry vertical where you're already big in it, how do you help solve that problem and create new products that come out of it? That's something each bank should be thinking about. In the verticals you're already big in, do you have the, are you, are you plugged into the software and the digital changes taking place in it? And how you complement that and, and deliver this type of optimization in a way that is not just delivering your products, but rethinking the products completely and reimagining it with, and there's tools. You, you don't necessarily have to build all this stuff. There are already, whether Personetics or other companies can help you do that, but that should be a very important management objective that you and your team have. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's really fascinating to watch the uh, the industry kind of embrace these challenges and also build in some ways new muscles or even relook, as you said, at at certain segments that may be may be attractive and underserved and uh, and uh, and not just earn the right to do. To deliver banking services, but to deepen relationships and uh, and and grow their customer franchise. So that's a good segue yeah. in terms of let's look ahead now. Uh, what do you think customers will demand of banks and credit unions in the next three years that the industry is not fully prepared for today? Well, I, I one I, I think that they like if you were. If you had a choice, you say, would you rather do a paper-based mortgage origination or, w- or would you rather do a completely digital mobile-based origination? No one would make the choice to say, no, I prefer all this paper and the stacks and stacks of paper and all these forms. Every so, so to me, if you don't have completely digital onboarding and if you haven't eliminated all these redundant forms and stuff, um, I think you are facing a grave danger of becoming yeah. irrelevant. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I, I don't think this is a millennial issue. I mean, my uh, my 91-year-old dad used to say, like, I, I'm so sick of, you know, Morgan Stanley sending me the same goddamn form. <laughs> time <which I'm> already <laughs> <filled out. laughs> you know, so so it's it's no one. No one wants to put up with it. And uh so that's that's one thing. I think that the uh, I think risk, you know, a lot of the risk systems are not designed to handle the evolution of risk as it both even as it is now, but the, what it's going to look like. And I could point out a couple of examples of it. First of all, if everything's real time but your account takeover systems are batch, that's not very useful. So everything needs to be real time. And then I also, we have this point of view, there's a convergence in effect of fraud and AML and cyber are all converging in a way because the you know, very sophisticated actors are testing are constantly testing uh, weaknesses. And that's going to get, you know, we've now taken large portion of the world and say they don't have access to these, uh, um, to the, the, the Western financial system. And I, so I think the number of players testing all that and sophistication of them will continue to get more and more sophisticated and faster and find uh, vulnerabilities and exploit them. So that to me is something that every financial institution needs to be, you know, make sure that you are thinking about that in a, in a complete way and, and also anticipating what, what it will look like. Well, Hans, I want to thank you. You bring such a unique and valuable perspective with your operating background, investment background, with your knowledge of the fintech space, as well as the the knowledge and uh, 
and appreciation you have for the challenges that the banking industry faces as well. Thanks for sharing your insights and your wisdom. And of course, uh, thanks for all the value you've brought to to Personetics and to me personally as well. Well, Jody, it's always been, uh, you've, you've been really a great partner to work with. And uh, and so thank you. Thank you for having me. And uh, and we expect great things from Personetics. <laughs> That's a good right. one. You've, you're setting a high bar. We're ready. All right. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you for joining another episode of Banking on Innovation. Make sure you subscribe to get future podcast episodes or follow us on Twitter at Personetics or on Personetics.com. Personetics.